we kind of had a break from our studies, our study on uh, the topic we've been looking at is the truth about death, dying, and grieving. Um, and um, I am making effort to prepare a very balanced study on the what I call I, I titled "Preparing to Die in the Lord." Preparing to die in the Lord. Our journey of faith, our journey on earth, is basically a progressive journey that can either end or transition in resurrection or in rapture. Do we believe that? Is that, is that part of your faith? Is that part of your faith? Our life will finally transition either by resurrection or by rapture. The key scripture we started with says that I don't want to have you ignorant we shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. Everybody say we shall be changed. You see, what I really want you to do, there are some of us, a few of some of us that still have difficulty believing what the scripture has said. You know, when Jesus rose from, the, rose from the dead and he met those two disciples going to a town called Emmaus, you remember that story? And the Bible said that um, he joined them and they were telling stories about Jesus. And um, they were really very concerned, very intense, extremely you know, worried about the situation. And, they, and just walked up to them and said, what is it that you are talking and your heart, faces, heart is looking sad? And they were like, are you the only man in Israel that does not know all that has been happening? And he said, what? He said, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man in mind in power and anointed heavily by God, who did all manner of great things and wonderful things, but the wicked men, the Pharisees and the Romans, they, cruci they get hold of him and they crucified him. And then when they finished telling that story and Jesus finally ended up wanting to have a meal with them, um, you know, one of the things he said to them is, why are you slow? in believing what the prophets and the and what and the law book you see you can actually be slow in believing the bible the bible says, if our gospel is hid is hidden from them who do what who perish the devil have a strategy for making you doubt whatever is written because the bible says Jesus said, he that believe in me as the scripture have written. One of the wonders and, and, and concern of Jesus when he was on earth is how slow the disciples were in what he was telling them. And I want to suggest to every one of you, if you still have doubt about the Bible, and I, would, I want to make the try to suggest this as a standard practice of every Christian, you should have a day in the week, you just fast and pray for the growth and the development of your spirit man you should have a day if you don't have one day at least one day in a week you are telling yourself this day just day is to is to invest into my spirit man i will take the liberty to tell you that it doesn't seem you're really serious about this your christian life because if you have a day for everything a day to pray a day to walk a day for everything a day to even have fun a day to go out and just a day to exercise your body and you are not having any concern about the state of your spirit man then you don't really understand what we are talking about or what is going on but i don't want to press that i just want to say that this is important so our life our you know whenever death happens what happens is that we all become very somber and uh, uh, what's the right word depressed isn't it because we don't expect it is it because we don't expect it why you know sometimes um when it happens suddenly we're in shock we're in shock yeah but when it happens and uh, you're watching the first thing and you're praying 
praying, believing God that things are going to turn out well, you know. One, it, it hits so much because you are not at the point of, okay, Father, no matter what happened, I still believe in you. Or you say, God, where are you? Why is this thing happening, you know? Is it that you don't answer prayers again? But at the end of the day, there is this struggle, however it happens, to try to come to terms with what has happened. Praise God. Because we will not see our loved ones uh, again or for some time. So it's like you build a relationship with somebody, very uh, good relationship, and it's just like suddenly cut short and you are not going to see that person like ever again. So but thank God for resurrection. Praise God. First of all, say you will not see the person ever again, and then you say you thank God for resurrection. <laughs> we, uh, you see, the, where are you going to now? Praise God. You know, I am really struggling to say a few things this morning, but um, I will make it for not to. Uh, yeah, before we even go there, last week we had people ask about two ago. There were questions people asked. And we say when we come today, we start with the question. What, what, was, what was the question again? Maybe you, not last week, I mean the week, the last time we have Bible study. Okay, so who else had a question? Somebody has an, a, asked a question. And we say we, we answer it today. Well, if there's none, that's okay. Um, okay, this morning, I think the reason why. I'm having the, we're having these studies because I want us to understand what it means to die as a Christian. Um, no matter when somebody dies, except if the person died extremely old, we never got to terms with death. No matter. And one more thing, I don't know also, how, how are you preparing for your exit? How many of us sometimes sit down to think about someday I'm going to die? Does anybody ever think about that? <laughs> Why are you touching your husband? She's not going to save you from that. <laughs> Praise God. Does anybody ever really, have you ever really thought about it? Some people say yes, they have. Even Michelle. You know, I like Michelle. He is very, she's a very thoughtful little child, very thoughtful. Now, when you think about that, what comes to your mind? Is it something that you, you think positively about and you are willing to embrace if it happens? Is it? There are some points, at some points that I, I, was, I, I have been forced to think of where I'm going to, you know, if it happens now. But one thing I know and the one thing I, I've been praying for, I ask God not to give me sickness or whatever so that when the day it will come, I'll just close my eyes and I'll see myself on the other side. Okay. <laughs> so I intentionally live as if it's going to happen the next minute so that whenever it comes, just I like transition. I, I believe it's a continuation of my life. Whenever I think of it, I'm just thinking about, okay, I am coming. That's what I say. So I face situations that tell God I am coming home. So I am coming home as in, I'll just close my eyes and find myself the other side. That's Praise what I believe. Praise God. You know what? I want us to make you have a conversation about, we've start, had this story about three times, isn't it? Or four? I want us to have a conversation this morning because the next, I think uh, the last study we will do will be next week and I'm going to be, you know, hopefully we'll be helped by the study 
to more like understand how to die and how to prepare for our our home coming. Praise God. Okay. Yeah. So I just wanted to talk about myself. When um, such thoughts comes to me, um, I try to revoke the thoughts and secondly try to distract myself from thinking about it because um, I, I believe for me if I keep on um, dwelling on, around that thought I may likely die before my time yeah I'm just I just have to tell us the truth yeah because <laughs> human being has the tendency of you know being influenced by things that scare them praise God I like having honest conversation. Yeah. My own, on, yes. The thought of dying is scary. But yes, there is, I, I don't think uh, there is any doubt about that. But personally, I have realized that it is part of nature, number one. Number two, as believers, we believe that when we die, that we go to a better place. But um, yeah. Like uh, Brother Kujobi has mentioned, yes, it is scary, but me personally, I have taken it as something that is bound to happen. Yeah, and uh, it is painful. I've lost uh, some close family members, and uh, the thought of it has not gone. Like, and the consequences, the, uh, the premature departures have caused. But physically, I have come to realize that the people that bear the brunt of the passing of a family member or loved ones, are actually the living, not the dead. And based on that, I am more concerned about what happens to me or to my soul when I eventually leave here, rather than worry about dying. Yeah. To me, it is bound to happen, and there is no two ways about it. So the only thing is to do the best I can to better the life of people that I will leave behind, and then not worry about it. Then, on the faith side, believing that, yeah, like uh, Brother Kekulu said, that we all meet in the resurrection morning. Yeah. Okay, praise God. I like some, uh, yeah, okay, I can try my, yeah, quick, yeah. Uh, for me, the thought of death used to scare me because I'm scared of symmetries. And what people, like you watch in movies, they do to dead people. But then I ask God to reveal to me the revelation of what to die is. And it has made me come to peace with it that even if the death process is maybe painful for others, like through sickness and like difficulties, like the moment you depart, that pain is gone. So that also calms me and just understanding that I'm in a better place. One example God showed me is like when I sleep and I'm in deep sleep, do I know what's going around me? No. So ex that's the exact same thing that will happen when I die. So even being in a symmetry, whatever thieves or witch doctors decide to do, I will not be able to feel it. Yeah. Praise God. Hi, Jim Um, I think uh, for a long time, Dying always comes with the fear of where you're going, for me personally. Um, especially as a young person, you know that, you know, life expectancy is that you will live till very young, very old, but we have seen that that's not always the case. And young people also can die early. And one of the questions that comes to me when I think about that is, like, how many people have I impacted for Christ? How many people can say, if I leave today, that when they met me, my life had a had an impact in them that they will never forget because it led them to Christ. And that's more so what I worry about when I think of death, is what impact I will leave when I die. More so about worrying about myself or how I will even die, whether it's through sickness or accident. I think I'm teaching what she said is true. I don't want to be in pain right before my death. But again, even if that happens, I'm more so concerned about what influence would I leave behind if I die? 
and seeing that you can die young, that means that nobody really has time because we don't know when we will be called home. So even as a young person, what am I doing now to, and what legacy am I leaving behind? Praise the Lord. Very good contributions. Very, very good contributions. Um, I'm just going to make a photo to kind of recap what we talked about death and uh, dying and resurrection uh, today. And then next week, I will try for us to answer the question of how to prepare to die. Uh, there are so many things that we fear just because of lack of our knowledge of what the word of God says. For example, once you understand fully what it means to die as a Christian, where you are going ceases to be a concern. Clearly, no, it's no more a concern. The second one, once you understand that your times are in God's hand and that you are on earth for a purpose, predetermined purpose, you know that you are not going to die before your purpose is fulfilled. Be dying well doesn't really mean dying old. And I think that was the part of the reason why Jesus, uh, God determined that just will die at the age of uh, 33. That's pretty young age, isn't it? So it is not, and it's not a bad death. The only thing we understand from the death of Jesus is that Jesus died after his purpose was fulfilled. The Bible said, when he said on the cross, it is what? Finished. Then he gave up the ghost. Then the third thing I, think I want us to understand that your death don't have to be in pain. It doesn't have to be in pain. You're actually, the way the death of most people that have invested into life in the, in the way that God wants us to invest or have, you know, have guided them to invest is unusually very peaceful and transient. The Bible said, precious in the eye of the Lord is the dead of his saints. Most people, when I read the Bible, in many occasions, whenever a saint, a servant of God, whenever they determine violent death for them, I realize that most times God does not really want. Jesus was going to be, to be pushed down the cliff, isn't it, many times. And what happened? He simply left. He didn't. He didn't let himself die that way. Because that's not the will of God for him. Even though he finally died by through the cross, but it was because that was part of his own purpose with God. He needed, the Bible says he was going to be crucified and, uh, you know, to take away. The Bible says, cause is he that hung on the tree. So part of Jesus' you know, process of death or no life was to die on the cross. So, I think that the job we have, or the duty I think myself to have in doing this study, because I think we've come to this study where I don't want to leave more questions in your mind than we have answered. My hope is that when we finish this study, we can all be confident. You know, the Bible, you know, in First um, Corinthians 15, 15, it says, it said, therefore, uh, can you put it on the board? Let's just read that. This is actually what should be. The, in the mind of every believer, as you prepare your life, as you live your life. First Corinthians 15, 58. He said, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast. Everybody say immovable. I don't know whether you understand, you see that many times when you read the Bible, the word steadfastness, faithfulness, and the, and the consistency, seem to come over and over. You know the reason? Our mind is so fickle. Our mind is shifting. One of the characteristics of God, the Bible says, is that he is without shadow of uh, turning. He doesn't change. And God said to the disciples, say, because I change not. The character of God is unchangeability. So he said, be immovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Now, let me tell us, the work of the Lord does not only mean working in the church. Part of the work of the Lord is your cooperation with God in 
trans doing things in your life. The Bible says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do what? To do those good things that God has decided for us to do. Somebody said to Jesus, what, how, what shall we do that we might do the work of the Lord? What did he answer him? He said, the work of God is to believe in him whom he sent. And many times when we say believe in Jesus, the way we understand it is that, is that we say, is we, the way we understand believe is that we, we know about Jesus. Knowing about Jesus is not believing in him. Do you understand that? Knowing about him is not believing in him. Believing in him means believing in what he, whom he is, what he said, and believing that he is the way. He is the truth. Believing in the word he has spoken. That, you know, Jesus will say, if you love me, you will keep my word. Then he said to the, to the Pharisees, he said, to them that believe, he said, if you continue in my word, everybody say continue. No, believing in John means adapting yourself to his word. And this, let me tell you this. This is one of the very difficult problems that we have as human beings. We have difficulty really believing God. Because believing God means that when he says go, you want to go. You are going to suppress your senses, suppress your judgment, suppress everything that your flesh and your mind is telling you. But because God has said go. You see, this was a problem that Peter and Jesus had. Jesus was talking about his death, and we know we have studied that. You remember that? I would like you really to go back to our former study. Now, let me ask us a question. How many of us usually look at our study, studies we've done before? So Any time, like just pick it up and look at it. How many of us? Yeah. Have, okay. Just, just check. Okay. So, so. Now, you see, this is, the, this, is the, this is the problem. The problem is that we do not see our Christian journey, life, as Something that we need to remember. Or something that we shall be examined on. How many of you have been a student? <laughs> and you have taken lectures. Those lectures you, take, you took, did you ever go back to read them at all? You did. Now, do we always go back to read what we study in class? Now, it's actually, it's, it's actually, I mean, before the exam. I know that once we are done with the exam. Why do we read them? You are, you are a step ahead of many of us. No, seriously. You see, the way we approach knowledge is very bad. And this is why we have this problem with people, people performance in job, in job places. You study something and you are doing a job in it and you don't know much about it. But you have passed all the exams. Because when you were going through it, you are going through it only to do what? Pass exam. It is for transformation. I said transformation. The things we study in the church is to transform your life. It is not to give you information. It is not to entertain you. It is to change you. That is why, that is the, this is the reason why we study all that we study. We listen to all the someone and then we post it even in our WhatsApp page. Nobody, most people don't go to even listen to it again. Because as long as you're concerned, that is not important for life. And I'm not saying that that is what you say, but that is what your behavior suggests. And in the same way, it applies to our school, our, our academics. We go to school, we study things. And once that, that, I'm happy that we are very truthful people. You finish it, you do what? You discard it. In fact, I've seen students, when after they have finished their school, finished, <laughs> finished their, you know, a particular year, they will sell all the books they used in the first year. Anyway, praise God. I understand why you do that. But you see, it only tells you the value you place, where your value is. It is value. It's value you place on something that makes you, you know, either seek it or not seek it. 
But that's not what we are talking about this morning. So the, what I'm talk, trying to say in effect is, try, uh, please try to look at all those studies we've done. Because the essence of this is that after we finish this study, as members of this church, you are not going to be afraid of death. Because you are so sure that your death is not going to be a random thing. It's not going to be there who wants it or when anything happens. You can actually come to that point. And you know, we saw that as we were studying. Someone like Paul came to a point in his life. He said, you know what? I'm actually interested in going now. He said that for me to live is what? Is Christ. But now to die is actually gain. He said, the only reason that I will choose to live is so that I can keep on helping these you people. But if you ask me, now, if I, whenever you come to that point, when you are so defiant and so unafraid of death, death will not touch you. Do you know how death kills people? By fear of death. Because the Bible said that one of the things that Jesus said, Jesus was manifested so that he can destroy him that has the power of death and deliver those who through the fear of death have been kept to what? In bondage all their life. So whenever you understand that that way, it ceases to abort. You, know, you, know, you know, the knowledge is power. So just say, when you know the truth, it does what? It sets you free. It sets you free from even attack of the devil. Now, do you realize that, the, that just knowing, just knowing that the devil has no power over you, overcomes the devil. He doesn't even need to, you don't need to try. I don't know what I've told you for this story. Many years ago, I think when I was, maybe I was probably 17 or 18 years old, I will remember, if I remember, the, I, I grew up partly in the village because I was born around the time the war was. So we have, we have to run back from wherever we, my father was. I remember the war with some, you know, childhood. You know the way you remember things as a child. You remember this one. You, remember, you don't remember everything. So during the war, during the time I was growing up, maybe like four, five, six, seven, eight years old, I lived, we lived in the village and I used to be so afraid of so many things. One of them is forest. Because there are so many bad stories they tell about forests. It's either they say that seven head demons are living there, or they say that uh, a very big snake that has 20 heads is residing. You know, there are so many stories they tell about it. Or they tell us that, you know, dead people or ghosts are always roaming around in the place. So, so much fear around my life. My grandmother even told me a story of how she was crossing one forest in my village and suddenly somebody that was dead long ago was past her and said, is there anybody coming up from there? You know, down there. Did you, okay, I said, did you meet anybody on your way coming down? He said, no. And then he crossed. He said, then when I got back, I was sick for so many, many, many weeks. So those fear was gripping my heart. Now, fast forward. When I was in my class four in, this, in secondary school, I gave my life to Christ. And I didn't do it. I didn't give my life to Christ, you know, with, with um, you know, the ways some of us do it this day. Gradually, I did it. When I gave my life to Christ, I was crazy. So, I was like, I was reading the Bible like anything. So, in that year, I don't remember the year, I went to the village. And then I had to go and visit my auntie in the other side of that forest. And for some reason, they delayed me. And I was coming back home. And the first thing that occurred to me, you are, a, you know, one scripture they put in my head, don't say that you are hidden in Christ and Christ is hidden in, in God. You know that where that, that scripture is? That's one scripture that was inside my head all the time. You are hidden in Christ and Christ is hidden in God. And they, you know, uh, the man that thought to say, if anybody will kill you, he will first of all kill God and then kill Jesus before he kills you. So I was, that day I was, I said, I was coming, but the fear came again and I said, oh God, how will I cross this thing? I tried to get somebody to go with me. Nobody wanted to go with me. So I started walking. And I said, I was walking. You know the way you walk and you're afraid? It seems you are hearing sounds. I think it's called hallucination. <laughs> it's me as somebody is following me behind. It looks to me as somebody is at the, in the forest. And I was just so scared. Then at the middle of the forest, I said to myself, you are hidden in Christ 
and Christ is hidden in God. How can somebody do anything to you here? And I just said to myself, damn you devil. And I just, you know, actually said it out. And I just walked majestic. That was the end of my fear of dead people. What, what did I use? Knowledge. Praise God. Okay, so um, the reason I, I'm telling us that story is that uh, today, let me just recap what, uh, what we did in our study. That's what it, and the last study we did because I was trying to get on to the next study and I'm like, I don't know how much we remember what we studied. That's, I'm just going to the introductory dis discussion. Uh, the scripture I want us to read, uh, though just one scripture, is uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 to 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 to 4. Is anybody happy? Okay, say, so for we know. Everybody say, we know. This, you know, when the Bible says, for we know, always ask yourself, do I really know that? He so, said, for we know that our earthly house, a tent, is destroyed. We have a building from God. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Verse 2. And in fact, we groan in this one, longing to put on our house from heaven. Uh -huh. Since we are clothed, we will not be found naked. Verse 4. Indeed, we are in this, who, we who are in this tent grown, burdened as we are, because we do not want to be unclothed, but clothed, so that mortality might be swallowed up by life. Praise God. Now, this is a very loaded statement. You know, I say it's loaded because there are so many things we can talk about here to understand. But the only thing I want you to, to talk about today is that we have a building with uh, God. But say, I have a building with God. You know, so we, let me just read through this because um, I don't think we have much time. Okay, well, finally we have our distance. Thank you. The truth about uh, death occurs when the spirit or the breath of God in a man departs the body or its earthly house. So we now know that our body is like our earthly house, isn't it? Do we, do we understand that? This body is what? Your earthly house. What we tell you that is that I don't know how many of us, um, I don't, I'm sorry to use this example. I don't know how many of us saw our brother gift when he was in the funeral home. When I went to see him in the funeral home, he was just gift. There was no difference with his jacket. Nothing changed. But he was not dead. You get what I'm talking about? So this we prove to you that that, this your body, is only what? A house where you live. That's, that's what it shows you. So you understand that, that this my body is only what? A house. And the reason I emphasize that is that, so you know how much you are investing in this body. In terms of time, in terms of effort, in terms of energy, in terms of resources, because this your house you have now. When you die, it's not the house you are going to carry to the other side. The Bible says we have what? Another what? Where did you not, you are not understanding? Verse 1, it says another building, which is where? With God. We have another one. So, essentially, as a Christian... The way you need to see yourself is that I have a house, I have a body with which I have to function in time on this earth, but I also have another body that I need to make sure is properly maintained and ready to be used when I live. Does that make sense? What does that mean? I just tired. I want to recap what I said. 
So when you are thinking about, you know why you are, we are so afraid of death? We think that when we die, our, now, like I heard Kantama say that I was a dead, uh, afraid of mortuary. I used to be. But you know what? When I got this truth, I remember that, you know those capstones that you have there? We have a mortuary. The people are not there. Those people are what? They are not there. They left. It's only a memorial that we are using to do what? To remember that there were once on earth. That's all. And when you get that, it really, like, like when you pass through mortuary, people will say, ah, look at all these dead people. They are not there. <laughs> they have gone. So, if you are looking for them, you know, when Jesus died, the, the angel said to, the, to Mary and they, he said, why are you looking for the living, living among the dead? He is not well. He is not here in the grave. Is that what he said? He is risen. It's not only because Jesus rose, you know, in his own capacity, his own resurrection is different. But the same way, the Bible says we know that when we die, that this our body, that which we wear, is going to decay. But he said we have another building. We are going to just get out of here. And take up our earthly, heavenly building. Praise God. I think I'm stretching this too much. I'll just read this. We have 15 minutes. So the spirit of God or the bread God gives uh, or the bread gives life to this body. Without the spirit, the body or the flesh is dead. So a body without spirit is uh, dead. The life-giving breath or spirit, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45, is, go is, is God's. It belongs to God. And death occurs when the spirit returns to God who gave it. We read that in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 5. And dust returns to dust. And what happens? Dust returns to dust. So how does death occur? When the spirit leaves the body and it turns to God who gave it, that's the way, the way we speak in Ecclesiastes. And then the body returns to the dust. Does that, is that clear enough? Okay. For emphasis, death as we know it now is the return to dust of the body that God formed to house a portion of his spirit, life is the living soul that became when God breathed his spirit into the man that he molded from the earth. Is that clear enough? The life we have, you, the you we see, is the living soul. You are alive now because of the breath of God that he put into you and your body, into the body he molded to house this living person. So the combination of the earth plus the breath of God gives birth to what? To the soul, the living soul. So when the spirit departs, that spirit needs to be housed in another body for the life, eternal life to come to start. <laughs> Praise God. Is that making sense to anybody? If you have question, you can ask question. I didn't say you must, but you can. <laughs> <I> said, <laughs> it's not a question. Just uh, as you are saying it, the, uh, there is this illustration that comes to my head. Like, uh, like right now, we are living here in the planet Head. God has given us, because the real person, just as you said, is the soul within us. God said, let create men in our image. So when God creates us in his image and likeness, it means that we are like God. We never die because God never dies. But that is the soul living in us. But for us to be able to live here on heart that God has created, God gave us a body that can work here, that can survive here. And for instance, if God is to create uh, another being that we live in uh, Mars mm -hmm. or in the moon, God will create in such a way that that body will defy the law of gravity. 
they'll not be able to fly around. They'll be able to, without wearing all these gadgets that the people there wear and things like that, they'll be able to live there and function. In the same way, when our soul leaves our body and returns to heaven, we are going to be housed with a body that can function in heaven, Amen. not yeah. in the one that we have here. Praise Pr the Lord. Praise the Lord. I think he's right. Praise the Lord. I'm just... It says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 19. Okay, I think I, I'm skipping something there. Okay, hence in Genesis chapter 3, verse 19, God says to the man after he fall, and I think uh, somebody had a question about this last time. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground, since you were taken from it. For dust you are, and unto dust you shall return. And we said, this was how God intended for our... You know, as I was reading this, I just tell you this, by the way. And this is trying to change my mentality about life. You see, after the fall, and like we observe, death was not part of God's plan when he made man. We remember that. That's not part of his plan. His plan was that the man should really multiply, increase, and dominate the earth and be and rule over all creation. Death was introduced because of what? Sin. So, and the way God, you know, because we have been bothered with this whole idea. God said, the day you eat the fruit, you shall what? Die. But they did not, did they die that day? We did try to answer that question. Did they die? <laughs> We are going back to it. We have answered this question something. We don't want to go back to it again. Yes, they, God did not say, the, he said, the day you eat it, you shall die. Actually, the way that death started was is the, what we just read in, just, in that 319. From the day they ate that fruit, the process of death started in their life. They did not finally die that day because if they died, the body, the soul would have, uh, the spirit would have departed and the body would have, uh, you know, returned to dust. But the process of death started that day. And how did God introduce it? And this is why the Bible says, talks about when you labor for the bread that perish. <laughs> did you imagine what Jesus was talking about that? Chief, what is it now? process of death starts uh, because of sin being introduced. Does that mean that, okay, as we are slowly, because as you get older, you, you get a little weaker, your skin doesn't look as plump. That, is that the spirit slowly, like, a, I don't know, is that the spirit of God slowly leaving us? And as it leaves, we are no longer able to be as vital as we were when we were younger. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. But that's not, the spirit stays, it abides. But what we are trying to see is that if you, uh, uh, read, read, let's read that scripture closely. It says, the, by, you will eat bread by the sweat of your brow. <laughs> what does that tell you? Suffering. <laughs> Hardship. And you know, I know we, we had this conversation about what about people in Nigeria who, or in some of the third world countries who are just being subjected to hardship for no cause, you know, no fault of theirs. We, and we talked about it, isn't it? And we said that that's part of what the cause introduced. Cause introduced that everything, you know, like God told Cain, he said that every man's hand shall be against you and your hand shall be against every man. So men, <laughs> as a result of the cause, men have begun to even kill themselves, mankind. Is it Ishmael? Okay, you know, I think that's also part of the cause of Cain. He said, if, if any man sees you, he will kill him. So as a result of the cause, you know, the order has been so distorted. So we have this thing happening in us. To answer your question, the spirit remains until the body cannot function anymore. But the body is being destroyed gradually by the cause that we, you know, when I read this, I said to myself, you know what? I think I'm going to make plan to, to work less with my body. 
Because, you see, he said, I'm not supposed to struggle so much to live. Of excessive struggle is, is agency by which death is trying to eat up my body. I know I'm, I'm raising the question for me, but that's not for you. That's for me. Excessive, there is, there is, there is something. It doesn't mean we don't labor, but we labor and the grace of God multiplies our effort. That's the way I want to live my life. I don't want to live my life in such a way that I am thinking that I must earn every dime. And I think I'm beginning to see it in my life now. Because I'm beginning to, this is, okay, this is the reason why you need to pay attention to the principles of the kingdom. Because if you don't adapt yourself to the principles of the kingdom, you will have to work this hard to earn a living. Hello? <laughs> okay, more questions in your mind. <laughs> Praise God. What did, what did Misha want to say? In the, the Old Testament, in Genesis, put your, when... Put your, use your mic. When yeah. um, they, they sinned and ate the fruit of... Um, of knowledge. Of knowledge. He said one time that there was another tree that God sent them out so that they will not eat the fruit of the tree of life. Yes. So I wanted to ask, doesn't um, God wants us, like, he promised us that if we obey like our parents, we live long. Mm -hmm. So doesn't he want us to, like, eat the fruit so that we <laughs> live young? Okay. He does. But not Adam. Adam has already broken the covenant, so he was not permitted to eat the fruit now, there. But that you said now, you say, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. This is the first commandment with a, a promise that you might do what? Live long. So the fruit of life in your own case now is to continue to obey your parents. You are eating the fruit of life. Does that make sense? Praise God. Hey. Where the mic is. Praise the Lord. My own is not really a question, but I think it's a contribution. And from what he said, he said they did not die, but I believed. They died immediately, they ate the fruit. What God was talking there is not a physical death. He was talking about spiritual death. So they lost connection with God. So the moment they ate that fruit, they died. They lost connection with God. Praise the Lord. Do you want to say something? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I, my... I have a question. Okay. Like you said, before you said that when you said that when Adam made the fruit, he caused other generations to to be to die. So I um, wanted to ask, what of if they didn't eat the fruit and resisted the temptation? And like you said that, and you said that when he ate it, he died. So. Um, so as I was saying, I said that what if they resisted the temptation and they didn't eat the fruit? Would they still die? Or would they still die and go to heaven? Or would they live on earth to, to earth with us? Or to the rapture? If they did not eat the fruit, they would not die. Because they died, they died because they ate the fruit. So what we... What we said, which I think you are referring to, is that we said that Adam's disobedience caused so many people to, to have problems, isn't it? And we are, we are, in that day we said that, so you be careful how you live because your own life has impact on people after you. Remember that? So that's what we said that day. No, I said that if they didn't, you said 
they will still live so they still live on earth so they still go to heaven did they go to heaven actually where they were living was in the presence of god they didn't need to go to heaven they were already in paradise they didn't need to go anywhere paradise was you know where god you know created for them to live forever it was the presence of god like heaven is heaven because god is there isn't it so god is in the where they were living so they didn't really need to go to heaven their life was supposed to be constant permanent progressively better and better and growing they're supposed to keep on multiplying keep on increasing keep on dominating keep on knowing god more and more that's what they're supposed to be doing but they they couldn't because they ate the fruit so if they didn't the generations after would be stayed at the garden of eden right? yes we would have been there all of us would have been there <laughs> praise god okay um our time is done katrama i will just give you the last opportunity and then you are raising your hand You see, when you talk about dying in the in the spirit, um, spiritual death, even in our own circumstance, is extremely progressive. Spiritual death is progressive, just like natural death is progressive. Adam, the 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 the, the to be cut off, to for them to die, of is for the spirit of God to be taken out from them. But because they could not maintain fellowship with God, that relationship was not growing. It was rather what? Diminishing. And as long as it was diminishing, they were gradually dying away. The same thing happens to us when we are Christians. Don't you think so? Many times our relationship with God is just dying. You know, like I am now. If I stop praying today, stop reading the Bible today, stop, uh, you know, obeying the word of God today, you are not going to suddenly see me, you know, dead. You are not even going to suddenly see me do certain things that is totally evil. Because something has already been planted in me. It will take my gradually, that's why we call it what? Back what? Basliding. So Adam's basliding started the day they ate the fruit. They just baslid gradually, prayed away from God. And I, I was trying to make sure that people understand what I was trying to explain with that Genesis chapter 3 verse 19. In that Genesis, he said that this is the way it will happen to you until you finally what? Die. You are not going to, you are not dead now, but your, your, your body will be worn out, your body will be destroyed gradually until finally, because once the body is destroyed, the spirit will live. The body can't exist one moment once the spirit is uh, lives. Praise God. I think we should end, stop there. Um, next week, we'll have a more uh, clear Bible study. Um, I'll just read the last uh, study, and that will be for next week. Today, we are studying what happens to the spirit or soul after the body is destroyed. And we read that in 2 Corinthians 5, 1. We read that if the tent of this earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands eternal and in heaven. The spirit of man does not just vanish or become assimilated. Rather, they are given another body. That's where I'm just summarizing. The body we now have is called earthly body, but there's also heavenly body, which, is the, part, which, which the departed spirit may put on when the earthly body perishes. Praise God. And just as we have uh, born the image of the man of the dust we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven from of heaven this is also called the resurrected body or the angelic body according to matthew chapter 22 verse 30 with different substance beauty and abilities praise god the heavenly body has different substance beauty and what abilities 
So the point I was making before, I just, uh, you know, in fact, like uh, in Luke chapter 20, 24, verse 36, we see Jesus' resurrected body. One of, one of the things we found with Jesus' resurrected body is that he was able to walk through closed doors. The Bible says, as the disciples were all sitting inside a room, he stood in their midst, and they were afraid. You know, and they, they were afraid. So he passed through, he could, you know, it becomes, you know, the, the resurrected body is a body with different abilities. The Bible will say that the glory of the celestial body is different than the glory of the terrestrial body. So there is diff there's a different body we are talking about. Praise the Lord. So the point I was just trying to make with us is when you understand you have two bodies you are going to exist in. The Bible will say, what manner of man are you supposed to be? What manner, how do you want to invest and live your life in terms of whom you sow to, what you are doing with yourself? But the Bible said that if you sow to the spirit, you will from the spirit, you live what? Eternal life. But if you sow to the flesh, you see what the, 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 the difficulty we have with our life or earth is that we lack this understanding that we are supposed to we are not finishing our life here. And that's actually why we become so afraid when, we, when death is coming. Because we are like, all the things I've, I've, <laughs> you know, I've accumulated. <laughs> you know, other people will eat it for me. No. That's why Jesus said, do not uh, store, store up for yourself treasures where? On earth. Where most we eat. But do what? Let those store for yourself treasure where? In heaven. He said, because it is where your treasure is, their heart will also, there is a gravitation, there is a pull to heaven world for you as you begin to invest into the heavenly things. Colossians said, if there you are risen with Christ, seek the things that are what? Above. He said, that it, I don't know whether you now understand that we are being disturbed and molested and deceived by the devil, making us think that our life is all about here. You have no interest in the kingdom. You have no interest in your soul. You have not, you don't have thought about it, that I need to really be sure that while I am working for this uh, in this place, I'm also working about my home in heaven. The Bible says, when we leave our earthly home, there's an, a home we have with God that we're going to return. Are you building it? Praise God. Are you building that hope? Are you building that hope? Are you investing into your hope with God? That's what will be the topic of our study next week. How we can build our heavenly hope. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> I believe there's no more questions. Let's just rise up and stretch and 